In the 1980s, the town of Keddie, California was referred to as the place the American dream went to die. Following a steep economic downturn, it became a place to escape rather than to settle. However, most still considered it a safe community to at least raise a family. It was the kind of place you could leave your door unlocked at night without fear of intruders. And everyone had their fair share of secrets and hidden pasts, but they weren't really looking to disturb their newfound peace. There were whispers of drug dealings and a small theft here and there, but mostly minor crimes. That is, until April of 1981, when three members of the Sharp family and one family friend turned up dead in Cabin 28, a quadruple homicide that, as of 2016, has gone unsolved for 35 years. Please join me in welcoming fellow horror YouTuber and narrator Let's Read as we present this tragic case to you. Today on Dark Matters, The Keddie Cabin Massacre. Once upon a time, the Ketty Resort served as a weekend getaway spot, but in the late 1970s, the business was forced to lower their prices, and soon the cabins filled with low-income families looking to make ends meet. For the Sharp family, however, the neighborhood was a dream come true. In 1979, Sue Sharp and her five children, five-year-old Greg, ten-year-old Rick, fifteen-year-old Johnny, along with 12-year-old Tina and 14-year-old Sheila, were stranded after Sue's abusive husband, James Sharp, kicked them out of their Connecticut home. In the midst of a divorce and with nowhere to go, Sue and her children moved to Quincy, California, where they piled into a cramped trailer for the next year. The family packed their bags again after Tina was molested by a neighbor and the family moved into the Ketty Resort in November of 1980. Cabin 28 seemed like a good place for a fresh start. The neighborhood was safe and quiet, nestled into the woods near a stream, and the cabin was spacious compared to their trailer. The eldest, Johnny, claimed the private basement bedroom, while the younger boys, Rick and Greg, were more than happy to share the room next to the living area. Tina and her mother shared the master bedroom but had to make room for one more when 14-year-old Sheila joined them in February of 1981. While things were better, life was far from easy. The Sharps had little money and lived off of food stamps and military stipends from Sue's ex. At the same time, Sue attended a local business trade school where teachers knew her to be diligent and smart. Her neighbors only saw a distant mother who liked her privacy but they forgave it for her kindness. Though she came across as a loner, Sue exuded a quiet confidence and charm that attracted men to her. Though she had her fair share of admirers, in April 1981, she was exclusively seeing a man named Daryl. They had the occasional date at the local backdoor bar, and Daryl sometimes stayed with Sue on the weekends. But on the weekend of Saturday, April 11th, Daryl was away in Paradise, California, visiting family. Sue stayed at home with the younger boys, who had their friend Justin over to spend the night. Johnny and his friend, 17-year-old Dana Wingate, spent the day in the neighboring town of Quincy. That evening, Tina and Sheila watched TV with their neighbors, the Seabolts, before Tina returned home around 10 p.m., leaving Sheila to spend the night in cabin 27. Sue told Tina to expect her brother and his friend to return home that night, and the children turned in for the night around 10 p.m. Sue followed about an hour after. Even if the Sharp family had pleasant dreams that night, by morning, Cabin 28 was the site of a bloody, waking nightmare. The morning of April 12th, the Seabolts and Sheila are up early in cabin 27, getting ready for church. Sheila crosses the yard back home at around 7.45 a.m. to change into her Sunday clothes. She opens the front door, maybe expecting to see her mother asleep on the couch or find the boys up eating breakfast, but instead she is met with silence. Silence and three dead bodies on the living room floor. 
the bodies of her mother, Sue Sharp, her brother, Johnny Sharp, and Johnny's friend, Dana Wingate. Horrified, Sheila sprints back to cabin 27, waking all of the neighbors with her screams of murder and dead. The Seabolts phone the police before returning to cabin 28, knocking on all of the windows, and they are relieved to discover that the two younger Sharp boys and their friend Justin appear unharmed. At first, it seems like they've slept through the entire night, completely unaware of the violence right outside of their bedroom door. They evacuate the boys through the window, saving them the traumatizing sight of the bodies in the living room. Officers from Plumas County Sheriff's Office arrive at around 8 a.m., and they review the crime scene, but right from the start, mistakes are made. The scene isn't properly secure upon arrival, and by the end of the morning, nearly all of the deputies have walked through the house before evidence is collected, possibly contaminating the crime scene. The authorities also fail to notify the Department of Justice of California until hours later. You're going to find police errors a common theme with this investigation, but upon seeing the horrific aftermath of the murders, I think it's safe to say that everyone, including law enforcement, was shocked by the brutal nature of the homicides. Sue, Johnny, and Dana had all been bound with varying widths of medical tape and double bound with electrical appliance wire, which indicated at least a semi-premeditation, as there'd been no medical tape in the house beforehand. Near the bodies was what authorities thought was a pocket knife, but upon closer inspection, they realize it's a steak knife that's been used with so much force, the blade has been bent backwards. Stab marks lined the walls and furniture, and police uncover a seven-inch butcher knife in addition to a bloody hammer. All three bodies were bound at the ankles and wrists, but Sue's body was covered by a blanket from Tina's bed, and she'd been gagged with a pair of her own underwear and a bandana. Unfortunately, their deaths hadn't been painless, and even suggested torture. All three had been bludgeoned with two different hammers, one of which was missing from the crime scene, and Sue had been beaten with a Daisy Powerline 880 rifle. Dana was beaten with an unknown weapon and strangled to death, while Sue and John suffered multiple varying-sized stab wounds all over their bodies, from their chests to their throats. Mother and son either died from the blunt force trauma or from blood loss. The extent of their injuries was too great to determine the cause of death. Police tagged over 100 pieces of evidence, including several of the murder weapons, one of the hammers and three of the knives. The rifle was never found and one hammer was still missing. The other items included the blanket that was covering Sue, the doorknobs from the front room and the boys' bedroom, which had blood on the living room side, and in total, there were 11 blood samples and nearly a dozen bloody fingerprints lifted off of various objects. The amount of evidence left behind was overwhelming, actually to the point where authorities concluded this hadn't been a swift act by a professional killer. They did believe, however, it was very personal. Whoever killed the victims knew them and harbored animosity towards them. Now, the initial police reports made no mention of 12-year-old Tina, who was not one of the victims, but she was also not anywhere in the house. Both Sheila Sharp and Justin told police that Tina was missing, and there was evidence suggesting she'd been abducted, but it seems both were ignored. Safely, it was hours, possibly even close to an entire day before authorities realized that Tina was gone. Precious hours that were wasted, as the more time that passes post-abduction, the higher the chance police will be searching for a body instead. And after they realize Tina was missing, possibly still alive, Plumas County finally contacts the Department of Justice to aid them in their investigation. But the department's involvement seems to only hinder the case, as you'll learn later on. Police had no witnesses to help them piece together what happened in the late hours of the 11th and the early morning hours of the 12th or it's possible they did have witnesses, but were either dismissing them because of their age or purposefully ignoring them. There are reports that the youngest sharp boy claimed he was awake during the murders before later changing his story to match his brothers, saying he'd slept through the entire night. And it seems their friend Justin went along with this narrative at first. However, Justin later told law enforcement that the night of the murders, he dreamt about Sue, Johnny, and Dana being killed and Tina being hauled away by two men. And keep in mind, as he tells this dream to authorities, he's still insisting he was asleep during the killings, despite the fact that only a wall and about 10 feet separated him from the actual nightmare. In Justin's dream, he's on a boat with two men, 
one with longer black hair and one with shorter brown hair. He describes their clothing in great detail, everything from their jean jackets down to the cowboy and army boots they're wearing. He says the men had hammers they used to attack Johnny and Dana, who fought back before they were thrown overboard. Justin then spots Sue's body on the boat, covered with a blanket, with a large slit on her chest. And Justin says in the dream he tried to stop the bleeding. But right after he finishes telling this dream to the polygraph examiner, Justin confesses that it wasn't a dream at all, but that he'd witnessed the murders. So he tells authorities everything he remembers without the guise of the dream to muddle any details. Justin hears a noise in the middle of the night and peeks through the ajar bedroom door into the living room. Sue is lying on the couch, and the two men he previously described stand in the middle of the room. Then, Johnny and Dana walk through the front door, and upon seeing the two men, an argument ensues. Then, a fight. Dana attempts to flee, but the brunette delivers a blow to the back of his head with a hammer. Johnny is attacked with a knife, and Sue rushes to his side before the men tie up all three of them. Justin says he retreats back into his room and hides behind the door. During the assault, Tina walks into the living room, dragging a blanket, asking what's going on. The men rush her and then drag her out the back door as she screams for help from her mother, who is already dead on the floor. Then, allegedly, the brown-haired man returns and covers Sue with a blanket. An hour passes before Justin goes back to bed and falls asleep until morning when Sheila and the Seabolts knock on the bedroom window. Justin walked home to cabin 26 and arrives at around 8.30 a.m., moments after he was pulled to safety. He doesn't stop to talk or eavesdrop, so he shouldn't have known a knife and hammer were involved, nor that Tina was missing, or that the victims had been tied up unless he'd seen something. Justin, in fact, seemed to be the only one who was sure of the identities of the victims. And on top of this, when Justin returned home, he had blood on his shoes. His mother gave them to the authorities, who later lost the evidence. Justin's story checked out, as police found the boys' bedroom door partially ajar when they arrived on scene, and they found blood on the knob facing the living room. Authorities now believe Justin witnessed part of the murders. But while he'd been rather detailed with the assailants' descriptions, he remained silent concerning their identities. It's possible he didn't recognize them, or it's possible he kept quiet because he did know them and feared for his life. But perhaps the most interesting thing about Justin himself was that he lived in Cabin 26 with his mother, Marilyn Smart, and his stepfather, a man named Martin, aka Marty Smart. And in the days following the murder, both Marty and Marilyn seemed to have something to hide. Evidence indicated that Sue was most likely the main target, and that Johnny, Dana, and Tina were the victims of circumstance and bad timing. After eliminating all of Sue's past lovers as suspects, and after Justin's confession, authorities turned their attention to Marty Smart. Marty, however, was no stranger to Keddy, and had lived with Sheriff Doug Thomas for a few weeks when he hit a rough situation. After meeting and marrying Marilyn, Marty, his new wife, and her two children from a previous marriage moved into Cabin 26 in August of 1980, a few months before the Sharps moved in. Then, in late March of 1981, a new house guest came to live with the Smarts, a man named Joe Bobede, who went by the name Bo. Marty and Bo crossed paths in a Veterans Affairs Hospital in Reno, Nevada. The two ex-military men immediately connected and began planning a sales campaign for a business they wanted to open up in Oregon. But Bo's interests were rumored to extend beyond business. He had supposed connections with the Chicago and Las Vegas mobs. Marty invited Bo to stay with him and his wife so they can continue to draw out their business plan together. But what happened between Marilyn, Marty, Bo, and Susan that could have led to murder? Marilyn and Sue became friends, most likely because their children were friends. They often confided in one another over a cup of coffee, and their friendship grew, despite Marty disliking the Sharps. He'd once called Johnny a punk and Tina a whore, but his biggest qualm was with how close Sue had become with his wife. Marty and Marilyn's marriage was on the verge of deteriorating, and he knew his wife revealed their marital struggles to Sue, who encouraged Marilyn to break things off. Marty sought therapy to help with his anger issues, 
in a desperate attempt to avoid the oncoming divorce, but he sensed Marilyn had already decided to leave him and he wholly blamed Sue. Bo, on the other hand, only met Sue a few times in the weeks leading up to the murders and he expressed great interest in getting to know her better. On April 11th, the day of the murder, Marilyn overheard Marty in a heated phone conversation in which he said if he didn't get his things straightened out, he might kill someone. Joke or not, distaste for her husband turned to fear and Marilyn suspected he was on the verge of snapping. It was time to take the children and leave once and for all. Police only had one witness to the actual murder, and his testimony was clouded with the trauma of what he'd witnessed, and they didn't trust his entire narrative. So in order to try and piece together exactly what took place during the murder, they have to put all of the pieces in the right order. So starting about a week before the murders, Marilyn Smart claims Bo would get up in the middle of the night and wander around outside. And this was around the time he first met Sue and expressed interest in her. And now we move to the day of the murders, April 11th, 1981. Johnny Sharp and Dana Wingate spend the day in the nearby town of Quincy. They hitchhiked back to town along State Route 70 and were picked up by a 17-year-old only named as Joey, who dropped them off at the entrance to Ketty. Johnny and Dana planned to return to Cabin 28 to stay the night. Back at the cabin, Sue's two younger sons, Rick and Greg, are having a sleepover with Justin Smart, as mentioned before, and around 7 p.m., Sheila and Tina Sharp go to the Seabolts in Cabin 27. Sheila plans to stay the night, but Tina does not have permission and only goes to watch TV for a little while. At 9 p.m., Marty, Marilyn, and Bo make plans to go out to the local bar, and Marty tells his wife they need to set Bo up with a woman. Marilyn says, Sue is alone, and all of the kids are probably in bed, she will probably like going. The trio goes to Sue's cabin to ask, but she declines their offer. The trio then goes to the back door bar. Both Bo and Marty are dressed in colored suits, eyeing the female customers as they walk in. 10 p.m. back at the Sharps' cabin, Tina returns home, and Richard, Justin, and Greg turn in for the night. From the couch, Sue tells Tina that Johnny and Dana should be home later that night, and Tina goes to bed. At approximately 11 p.m., the tenants of cabin 14 return home, one occupant glances at cabin 28 and sees Sue doing dishes in the kitchen. Then, around midnight, Justin claims Johnny and Dana return home, possibly in the middle of the attack, though it's unknown how he knew this. So after having no luck with the women, Marty, Bo, and Marilyn leave the bar at around 1 a.m. and return to cabin 26. They walk home and pass cabin 28 on their way. Marilyn watches TV, then goes to bed, while Bo and Marty return to the bar around 1.15 a.m., again walking past cabin 28 on their way. That night, most of the neighbors sleep peacefully, including the Seabolts, who are just feet away from cabin 28. Only one neighbor in cabin 15 hears muffled screams around 1.15 a.m., but they dismiss them. And around 2.30 a.m., a bartender at the back door bar walks to her car where she hears what sounds like people putting something into a car. She hears a male and female voice, but sees nothing. And at 4 a.m., a neighbor in cabin 23 notices the Sharps' back porch light is on. Then the fateful moment around 7.45 a.m. when Sheila discovers the dead bodies of Sue, Dana, and Johnny in the living room. Authorities are called and they begin their investigation. Around 8 or 9 a.m., a friend shows up at the Smart residence to help Marty cut wood and finds him burning debris along with a pair of men's shoes. Marilyn wakes at around 8.30 and both Marty and Bo are in the cabin. She learns of the murders when Justin arrives home and she hands over his bloody shoes to law enforcement who lose them later. Justin and Marilyn speak with Sheriff Doug Thomas, who, remember, was a friend of Marty's. The sheriff asks Marilyn if the female body could be Tina and Justin interrupts and says this, that's not Tina in there, it's Sue. Tina is missing, look down by the river. Later, one of the investigators attempts to hypnotize Justin, at which point he outwardly, unmistakably accuses Marty of the murders. After the conversation with the sheriff, Marilyn's fear is tinged with a sense of urgency to get away from Marty. Marilyn makes arrangements with a friend and tells them she believes Marty is behind the murders. Marty, Bo, and DJ Lake, another neighbor, say that they're taking Bo to the VA hospital in Reno and they depart in Lake's car. 
Marilyn takes her kids to her friend's house and returns to cabin 26 to gather belongings, and while there, she finds a bloody hammer in a sack in the basement. However, in 2006, she claimed to remember nothing of this statement and says it simply isn't true. That night, Marty returns from Reno, but stays with a friend in a neighboring town. And his friend notices Marty is unusually restless. He's pacing, agitated, and possibly high. Marty keeps saying he has to get back to Ketty to finish something he started, but the friend refuses to take him back that night. So now we move on to everything that happened after the 12th, all the way up to the present. Police continue their investigation, however, many of the original reports appear to have been altered to give the impression that authorities realized Tina was missing right away, when we know for a fact they did not. A few days after the murders, Plumas County calls the Department of Justice, or the DOJ, requesting their assistance. DOJ detectives question Marilyn, Marty, and Bo, but transcripts reveal that A, authorities spoke to the suspects before their interviews informally gathering undocumented information, and B, that the DOJ officers blatantly ignored discrepancies and incriminating statements in both Marty's and Bo's interviews. During Bo's interview, the DOJ officers treat Bo with little scrutiny, as they believe he is a former police officer. This is something Bo told them before the interview, and also something that was a total lie. Bo was never a cop, and he continues to lie throughout the interview, but his obvious inaccuracies go ignored. At the beginning of the interview, he knows which cabin is the Sharps, but by the end of it, he claims not to. He claims he'd been in Ketty for a month, but he was only there for two weeks. He said he arrived at the bar at 9.30 to 10 originally, then changed it to 12 a.m., and that Marilyn was his niece when they had no blood relation whatsoever. He claims he never even met Sue Sharp when he'd met her at least two times, and he said Marilyn was awake around 2 a.m. when he returned from the bar for the second time, when Marilyn didn't wake until after the bodies were discovered in the morning. The DOJ detectives questioned none of this and let him leave. Marty's interview goes much the same way. Marty says that Justin could have seen something the night of the murders, quote, without me detecting him, implying he was present during the murders. The detectives never acknowledge this. Without prompting, Marty says he heard a hammer was used in the murders and that he himself was missing a hammer with a dark blue handle, one that matched the description of the second hammer not present at the scene. Marty, in fact, was very chatty about the murders, saying how their deaths were overkill, and that if it had been him, he would have made it a swift killing. Again, detectives ignore his disturbing statements and release him. April 14th, just two days after the murders, Bo leaves town and moves to Oregon, where he starts going by the name Bobby Lake. And on April 17th, Martin passes a polygraph test, and law enforcement clears him of any involvement. But what Marty says in several subsequent therapy sessions makes most believed he was at least involved in the killings. He tells his therapist that he's in trouble, that he was being blamed for things his guy friends probably did, and in his next session, without provocation, he refuses to discuss anything but a bitch of a friend of Marilyn's whom he blames for turning his wife against him. Many believe he is referring to Sue. On the 27th of April, he walks into his session unnaturally calm. He tells his therapist, in a very matter-of-fact tone, that he's going to reveal the truth about what was bothering him. He says, quote, I killed the woman and her daughter, but I didn't have anything to do with the boys. As to why he did it, he believes that Sue was the reason Marilyn wanted a divorce. He says Tina saw the murders and he couldn't have a witness. When describing Sue's murder, the therapist noted that he was monotonous, apathetic even. Talking about Tina's murder made him uneasy, however, saying she didn't fight back as he'd incapacitated her. The therapist urges Marty to turn himself in, at which point he simply smiles and says, I beat the polygraph. Those things are easy to beat. I was lying, and they let me go. Probably due to doctor-patient confidentiality, the therapist does not inform the authorities. And by his next therapy session, Marty bids farewell, saying he's moving to Oregon as well, and he leaves not long after. The Department of Justice detectives did interview the therapist and thought the details offered could possibly move the case forward. The therapist assumes that Marty was arrested, but that never happened as he was already long gone. July 1981, Sheriff Douglas Thomas resigns for unknown reasons. He goes on to instruct at the local college and sell insurance. In 1984, a skull and several other bones are found near Feather Falls, approximately 30 miles outside of Ketty. 
Authorities don't make the connection to the murders until they receive an anonymous phone call from someone who tells them the bones belong to Tina Sharp. Dental records prove the caller right. They concluded that she'd been murdered around the same time as the others, but they could not say how she died. Some suspect that Bo, Marty, and Lake didn't go to Reno the morning after the murders, but they drove to Feather Falls to dispose of Tina's body. And no investigation was made into the call itself, even though police believed the caller was involved in the killings, which doesn't help the theory that the police had something to hide. Over a decade later in 1988, Bo allegedly dies of natural causes, but many people don't believe he actually died. Remember, he had mob connections, and around the same time, his uncle Alvin also died under suspicious circumstances. The documentation of Bo's death caused many to speculate he faked his death and was in hiding. Then, in 2000, Marty passes away, possibly from cancer, and is allegedly cremated. It isn't until 2010 that Marty's therapist comes forward with his confession. Plumas County reinvestigates, but the main suspects are dead and there isn't much they can do without more evidence. Over the years, Plumas County gains a new team of officers, plus a special investigator named Mike Gamberg, who's looking into the case. Gamberg finds the tape of the anonymous phone call on March 14th, 2016, buried under a pile of papers in the sheriff's office, unopened and unlabeled. He hopes the new technology can match the voice to a suspect. And just 10 days later, on March 24th, there's another break in the case, largely due to the efforts of those at Keddy28.com, a site that has continued to speculate, research, and document everything the police failed to in the 80s. One member of the forum was out scouring the forest near the murder site with a metal detector and came across a rusty hammer. Investigator Gamberg takes the hammer into evidence, calling it a major find. The hammer has a dark blue handle and closely resembles the one Marty claims he lost just before the murders. Police hope that beneath all of the rust, there's something to tie it back to Marty and finally confirm his involvement. Even 35 years later, hundreds of unanswered questions still linger. Did Justin lie to authorities to protect his stepfather, or because he was threatened and feared for his life? And if Justin did witness the murder, why did the assailants take Tina and not Justin? Was it because Marty knew he couldn't harm Justin without completely destroying his marriage? But more importantly, with so much evidence, why is the Keddy Cabin murder still unsolved on paper? Many believe corrupt law enforcement is to blame, and that Bo's mob connections scared detectives and that Marty's involvement was ignored due to his relationship with the sheriff. Even with a mountain of evidence, much of which has since been lost or destroyed, we may never know the truth. Through their research, experts have mostly agreed on several facts. Portions of Justin's accounts of the murder are false, and he was likely threatened to change his story or remain silent, either by the killers or by law enforcement. Tina and Sue were likely attacked in their bedroom before the struggle moved to the living room. Johnny and Dana walked in on the murder and were killed, possibly even tortured along with Sue. They speculate one of the surviving boys placed the sheet over Sue after the killers took Tina away. Tina was then hidden, dead or alive, by an accomplice before she was taken and dumped at Feather Falls. The killers destroyed evidence, cleaned themselves up, and rearranged the bodies before the sun rose in the morning. Whether the Plumas County was unequipped to handle a crime with this magnitude of violence, or whether it was a deliberate cover-up, experts also agree that police error was a major factor in the case going unsolved. The investigation was clearly botched, as bloody fingerprints collected from the scene were never compared to the suspect's fingerprints. And even after Sheriff Thomas's resignation, the department remained tight-lipped and refused assistance from outside agencies until 2016. Regardless of the evidence against Marty, many have proposed different theories that are at least worth mentioning. Theory 1. Johnny and Dana led strangers back to the cabin while hitchhiking, and the strangers committed the murders in a seemingly random act of violence. Some think these strangers could have been serial killers Leonard Lake, and his accomplice Charles Ng, who killed anywhere from 11 to 25 people in California. 
while they resembled the composite sketch. This would have occurred before their known active killing period from 1983 to 1985. Theory number two. The FBI profiles the scene and proposes another theory, that an older man, a fatherly figure or romantic partner, planned to help Tina run away, and that the murders were a result of being caught trying to take Tina. The FBI believes Tina was the one who covered her mother's body before leaving. Even if she was with a trusted companion, showing any remorse for the murders could have put her in danger, as her killer would have wanted to silence her to protect himself. This stranger could have possibly been Daniel Workman French, who was arrested for molesting Tina in 1979, and some allege he was out of prison around the time of the killings. However, this theory has long been discredited by experts, as they no longer consider serial killers or passerbys as suspects, given the evidence. The general consensus is that Marty and Bo were responsible or heavily involved in the murders and that Marilyn was possibly an accomplice or knew more than she ever let on, given that her story changed multiple times. But no matter who killed Sue, Johnny, Tina, and Dana, they escaped punishment and got away with murder. Following the tragedy, the remaining Sharp children lived with their father once again, and they eventually stopped talking about it altogether. Perhaps it was too painful to keep driving the knife further into a wound that would never heal. Marilyn went on to marry and divorce one of Marty's best friends, and she allegedly still lives in Plumas County, which is now nearly abandoned. In 1984, Justin was sent to live with one of Marilyn's ex-husbands, and he never opened up about what he saw again, maybe remembering the threats, or not wanting to relive the nightmare again. And no one would have to, as cabins 27 and 28 were demolished in 2004. In 2002, the documentary Keddie Murders Cabin 28 was released, but Keddie28.com claims it is riddled with misinformation, gives only a one-sided account of the case, and was borderline slanderous. And speaking of Keddie28.com, the current sheriff of Plumas County, Sheriff Hagwood, and investigator Gamberg have largely credited the online community of internet sleuths with keeping the case alive and doing much of the legwork for officers who actually want answers. The website's founder prefers to remain anonymous, but he, the sheriff, and investigator Gamberg now have a working relationship and hope that together they can bring rest to the horrific injustice done to the Sharp family and the family of Dana Wingate. They are currently investigating six persons of interest concerning the murders, and while no arrests have been made yet, it is considered active again after being cold for three and a half decades. If you have any new information, you can call the Plumas County Sheriff's Office at 530-283-6360, or you can find that number and all available case information down in the description below, along with sources for this video and additional reading. Special thanks to my collaborator for this video, Let's Read, who now has a message for you. Special thank you to Kaylee for having me on today. And if you're in the mood for more spoopy tales, be sure to head over to my channel, Let's Read to check out our collaboration where we narrate four creepy true cabin stories. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon. And I just wanted to add to that, that this was the longest script I've ever done, but he was up for the challenge, and I think he really delivered. I know most of you are really into creepy stories, and you should most definitely head on over to his channel and check out the other half of that collaboration. And it's perhaps not as tragic as this case, but it's definitely equally as terrifying. Show him some love and subscribe. He's also got a plethora of other videos for you guys to binge watch. Tons of awesome stories, Reddit, true stories, to good old fashioned creepypastas, to even Lovecraftian horror. So go check him out. You will not be disappointed. Next, I would like to thank Co.ag Music. I've recently been trying to find the right music for my Dark Matter series, and Co.ag delivered. He's got everything from ambient pieces to piano pieces, and really awesome, suspenseful synth tracks like the ones you heard in today's video. If you're looking for some spooky ambience to listen to, or if you're just a creator looking to add some incredible music to your library for your narrations or what have you, I would really appreciate it if you guys would head on over to the channel, check out his stuff, and show him some love because he totally totally deserves it. Finally, I just want to say a special thanks to Keddie28.com, who's provided a wealth of information for this case. I've barely scratched the surface, but many people on the forums over there have direct ties to those involved in the case, or have been investigating it since its occurrence, 
years of research and field work that I will never have. And obviously their hard work has paid off immensely. And I think it's important to acknowledge that the internet community can make a real world difference. And again, I've merely scratched the surface concerning the complexity of this case, but Ketty 28 is a large part of the reason that I believe it's never been left in the dark. Thank you all for giving this horrific case a moment of your time. Uh, it's been long requested and it was such an extensive script, I think it was the perfect time to bring in help. And I had wonderful help. So if you haven't already, head on over to Let's Read channel for the second half of this collaboration for some more creepy cabin stories. And believe me, out in the middle of the woods in a cabin is not any place you want to be. There's tons of top-notch content over there for you guys to binge as well. And as always, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. It really helps me out a lot. And if you want to see more of me, you can hit that subscribe button down below, and you can find my playlist of other unsolved cases down in the corner over there. So thank you. That's all I have for you today. Stay safe, friends, and hug a loved one, and have a good night.